Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A U.S. convenience store and gas station chain had malware that stole customer payment info for more than half of 2019. If you live in the U.S., stick around. You may be affected. A brain implant has been invented that can read people's minds and turn their thoughts to speech. Amazon's Ring devices were a privacy nightmare in the 2019. Now the company wants to improve its image by giving users control over their security. The company that brought us the Impossible Burger is now doing a plant-based pork substitute as well. And Google is adding new privacy and scheduling features to their virtual assistant. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. Some quick honorable mentions this week. CES may be flooded with new tech coming out soon, uh, but it's also a great place for companies to show off things that they're working on that may not be coming out to the public. Dell's doing just that with its Alienware gaming family showing off a new concept device dubbed Concept UFO. It's a handheld gaming console that looks similar to a Nintendo Switch, but it's built for full-fledged portable PC gaming. Wow. The handheld gaming console sports an 8-inch display and removable controllers on both ends. Sound familiar? Due to the inclusion of such a large display, Concept UFO is, in fact, noticeably larger than a Nintendo Switch, and it feels bulkier from what I've been told. The working model arse journalist Valentina Palladino got to look at, ran Windows, and was able to render playable games in handheld mode, docked mode, in which a console was connected to an external display and its controllers were detached, and another portable mode in which the controllers were detached but connected by a center bridge. Sony, yes, Sony, has even demonstrated its electric car concept. Wow. They didn't suggest that this is meant for the public, but rather it's being used as a platform for them to demonstrate some of their up-and-coming sensor and entertainment tech. Hmm. The Vision S dashboard is flanked by an ultra-wide panoramic screen for driving information and entertainment combined. Among the internal features of the car is sensing technology that can detect occupants of the vehicle and even recognize them in order to allow for gesture control of the entertainment systems. Hmm. In total, Sony has included 33 sensors in the Vision S prototype. The Japanese firm is known to have developed portable image sensors that can be used to analyze the road in front of the vehicle as well. More from Sony. It's all about Sony right now, but there, ex- uh, as expected, uh, the PS5 is shaping the future of gaming, but also the next generation console is inspiring their home cinema devices as well. Uh, with Sony's newest TVs, they're made specifically with the PS5 in mind, including its 8K wow. resolution. The flagship Z8H can, that's my Canadian pronunciation, is it the Z8H? We'll say, we'll we'll stick with Z. Z Z8H can play at both 8K and 4K with a full array LED and a built-in audio system that outputs sound based on the location of the images on screen. Hmm. It's also an 85-inch screen. It's huge. Whoa. Uh, There are some more mid-ranged LCD models in the lineup as well, with five different sizes available uh, and able to support 120 hertz 4K. Wow. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. U.S. convenience store Wawa recently discovered malware that skimmed customers' payment card data at just about all of its 850 stores. The infection began rolling out to the store's payment processing systems on March 4th of last year and wasn't discovered until December the 10th. It took two more days for malware to be fully contained. Most locations' point-of-sale systems were affected by April 22nd, 2019, although some locations may not have been affected at all. The malware collected payment card numbers, expiration dates, and cardholder names from payment cards used at Wawa, in-store payment terminals, and fuel dispensers. The advisory didn't say how many customers or cards were affected. 
The malware didn't access debit card pins, credit card, CVV2 numbers, or driver license data used to verify age-restricted purchases. Information processed by in-store ATMs was also not affected. Hmm. The company has hired an outside forensic firm to investigate the infection. People who have used payment cards at Wawa locations should pay close attention to billing statements over the past eight months. It's always a good idea to regularly review credit report as well. Wawa said it will provide one year of identity theft protection and credit monitoring from credit reporting service Experian at no charge. Hmm. You get gas and now you got to go through that. Yeah. I can't believe that it was active for so long before they actually realized. I feel like perhaps one year is not long enough. Just say in Wawa, maybe bulk Mm -hmm. it up a little. (laughs) That's unfortunate though. It is. It's sad. And I mean, when you're traveling, you don't think... Is my information safe? Like you, you got yeah. to go. go to whatever gas station is yeah. most available. Mm-hmm. But That's my dad I mean. always said, go to the same gas station all of the time. That way, you know, if there's a problem, you know where it came from. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work if you travel though. No, it does not work in that case. Mm-hmm. Scientists have developed a brain implant that can read people's minds and turn their thoughts into speech. Mm. The team at the University of California, San Francisco, says their findings published in the journal Nature could help people when disease robs them of their ability to talk. Experts said the findings were compelling and offered hope of restoring speech. The mind reading technology works in two stages. First, an electrode is implanted in the brain to pick up the electrical signals that maneuver the lips, tongue, voice box, and jaw. Then, powerful computing is used to simulate how the movements in the mouth and throat would would form different sounds. This results in synthesized speech coming out of a virtual vocal tract. Instead of scouring the brain for the pattern of electrical signals that code each word, the focus is on the shape of the mouth and the sounds it would produce. Hmm. Professor Edward Chang, one of the researchers, said, quote, for the first time, this study demonstrated that we can generate entire spoken sentences based on an individual's brain activity, end quote. Hmm. The technology is not perfect yet, but shows incredible promise. Here, let's listen to an actual recording of the system reading its user's brain waves and saying, quote, the proof you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. As you can hear, it's not quite perfect, but keep in mind that was generated by reading someone's brain waves. In experiments with five people who read hundreds of sentences in their heads, listeners were able to discern what was being spoken up to 70% of the time. Beyond helping restore speech, there is also the more distant prospect of helping people who have never spoken to learn to speak with such a device. An example might be a child with cerebral palsy. Professor Sophie Scott from the University College London said, quote, This is very interesting work from a great lab, but it must be noted that it is at the very early stages and is not close to clinical applications yet. End quote. Well, you can say that, but that is incredible. You- right. So, so, like, why didn't they think of this before? Because it's like my approach to weight loss this year is like, right. I'm not trying to lose weight. No, I'm trying to learn how how my body reacts to certain things so similarly they're learning the the movement of the mouth right like the same way like i think about uh like uh false limbs like robotic limbs they use nerves to actually control the hand and everything so this is like that but moving a false mouth in a way exactly to make the sounds the interesting thing about this though is the fact that it's using the brain signals that would go to the mouth and voice box implies that you have to have already been able to speak. Right. That's why they're saying eventually it will mm-hmm. be. Right. So I think it would be hard to train somebody who's never spoken, and maybe that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you might have, like, a nonverbal autistic child. Yes. You wouldn't be able to use this 
not the way it's written. That's not necessarily not, yeah. true, though, yeah. b- because we don't. And and there are cases certainly where it's not going to be applicable. And another case would be somebody who stopped speaking because sure. yep. of, say, brain brain damage that has affected yep. their ability to generate those signals. Mm-hmm. So, but what if the signal cutoff is somewhere between the brain and the mouth and the vocal right. cords? What if, like, I you're talking about. Uh, the, a child who can't speak well mm. sometimes you'll see them moving their mouth but there's no sound coming out mm. mm-hmm. and, and and so there are cases where maybe maybe the brain is sending the signal but maybe it's not being interpreted correctly yeah. or maybe there's a mm. a nerve that's not functioning correct who knows right but this is a case where it's, it's not going to work for it's not a cure all for exactly. everyone right but with 70% accuracy this well here's the thing this is the starting point the yeah. starting point is 70 percent accurate i can't even believe they're here i know it'll be interesting to see how this plays into things like um end of life care and legal rights as oh. far as ability to take care of themselves i mean how many people have you seen their health deteriorates and they end up in a position where they can no longer communicate but maybe if it's muscular Right, but maybe in their head, they still have the ability to process those thoughts. and it's like like ALS. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that could be very interesting. Or somebody who has suffered a stroke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally cool. Great. So cool. (laughs) Exciting. We have got to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. With criticism mounting, Amazon's Ring revealed a web dash- dashboard of privacy controls it hopes will slash the number of horror stories coming from customers. Earlier this week and in time for CES, the home surveillance camera and internet connected doorbell specialist made a point of unveiling an account control panel it hopes will allow users to better manage the access settings on their devices and keep hackers and other intruders out. The new controls will be available across all products. Ring said in the announcement, quote, the control center will initially let you see and manage your connected mobile, desktop, and tablet devices, as well as third-party services. It will also enable you to opt out of receiving video requests in areas where local police have joined the Neighbors app, Hmm. end quote. This comes after Ring found itself under fire on a number of fronts for its privacy policies and security protections. Civil rights groups have raised concerns since the cameras provide officers excessive levels of surveillance power. In short, Ring encourages its customers to share their web-connected camera footage with neighbors and the police, opening up a whole can of worms regarding privacy and consent. Mm. While it's clear there are privacy concerns over cheap surveillance devices being installed in people's homes, hopefully the move to a user-controlled dashboard will help improve security. Definitely. Uh, It's interesting, isn't it, how these smart devices originally, when they first started coming out, were taking away the security control from the user. So we were all having to make the assumption that our devices were secure. Now, as we're learning, no, there's actually problems. Now they're saying, okay, we're going to create interfaces for you to be able to um, control that security. And they're adding features. And, and, you know, you can say smart devices and connected devices are a bad thing. Well, they're probably not. They're just young. And I think we do have to give some grace to the companies that are manufacturing them sure. because yes. they are they're learning from their mistakes. And I think they're they're proving, that too, that they're making changes based on those mistakes. I heard one argument that, well, it doesn't enforce two factor authentication by default. And I thought, wow, what today? It doesn't force two factor authentication. Mm-hmm. And I set up a bank account with my bank this week and they gave me online banking. And, and they factor. didn't enforce two-factor authentication. You, ha- you can opt into it. However, right. But they don't but enforce it. the bank didn't do it. So yeah. we're being really hard on a new platform. That's true. For the very same thing that the bank here in Canada, like mm-hmm. I'm, not ta- I'm talking TD Canada Trust. Yeah. Like a big bank. They don't enforce either. Right. 
so so we got to put things into context but yes uh, i think it's a good thing that companies are starting to respond to their users and i think it's kind of neat that they're creating a capability for law enforcement to utilize neighborhood cameras i remember there was a car accident um in the summer um someone driving a tesla um at top speed hit a hill and crashed it right remember that yes i do and the police were able to tap into uh, a surveillance camera on a house nearby oh, and cool. they saw the entire accident like that's cool Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want our privacy violated. That's right. the thing. We have to find the line. And I, I think having control and being able to say, okay, the, the one in my garage is mine. Yes. The one that's pointed at the street. You can have, you that. can, you can have access to that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just having a certain level of user control is a good thing. Interesting. Uh, yeah. hmm. <laughs> you know what? I was going to go off on a tangent and I'm like, nope, just going to stop. New year, new decade. Oh, not gonna go there. Is this is this your resolution? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A plant-based pork substitute has been launched at CES by one of the leading alternative meat producers. A food product unveiled at the CES Tech Show? You betcha. Hmm. There's some serious tech involved in creating this sustainable alternative to meat. The new product contains no gluten, animal hormones, or antibiotics, and is designed to comply with kosher and halal rules. Huh. The firm's sausage and plant-based pork products, similar to ground beef substitute, are made using heme, a molecule derived from plants that contains iron and resembles blood. Heme is found wow. in real meat, but can be produced without farming animals. Impossible Foods founder and chief executive Patrick Brown says their expanding product uh, says of their expanding expanding product line, quote, "We won't stop until we eliminate the need for animals in the food chain and make the global food system sustainable." End quote. Beyond that, Impossible Pork contains around half the calories of sausage meat and is also significantly lower in fat. Until recently, China was home to around half the world's farmed pigs, but millions of them have died or been culled due to the spread of the African swine fever, a viral disease that infects pigs and has no known cure. Pork is huge, in huge demand in Asia. China alone produces and consumes more of the meat than any other country. Impossible Foods say that their synth synthetic pork product will suit a variety of Asian dishes. Oh, that's interesting. interesting. We're we're at that point where, like I I think I said on a show years ago, won't it be neat when they can synthesize this? Right, and they're here. They are in that that tricky little spot where they're just about to tip right over into mm -hmm. full synthesization. I can't speak, but um, but it, what's weird about it from a technology standpoint is that it's like meat, like it's not like ground mushrooms held together with gluten, right. That's where I have a hard time. So I don't eat meat, but I don't eat meat because I don't like meat. And so I okay. don't like the impossible So that's different from the ethical exactly. or um, sustainability perspective. Exactly. Whereas like people who want to eat healthier or want to, mm -hmm. to tread lighter Less on the earth, I'm happy that all of those things are happening in my life, but that's not the reason I don't eat meat. Okay. So once they're able to do bacon... I think that that's the point when everybody in this whole world is going to be like... <laughs> and everyone who says, but they have vegetarian bacon. But it's not. It's the not. Same. <laughs> I, and I can tell you that because I like the vegetarian bacon and I don't like bacon. So that means mm. that it doesn't Weird. taste like bacon. How do you not like bacon? <laughs> no. Do I do like I, on the other now. hand, eat meat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And but But I've tasted a lot of these alternatives. Yeah. Have you tried the Impossible Burger? Does anyone sell it? Um, yes. Plenty of places, including grocery stores. Any, and it's very Any expensive. restaurant exam? Um, um, I think the... Um, what's the one? On I think the one that I've tried is Beyond Burger, not Impossible Burger. Right. That's, that's what, A&W or something? Yeah, A&W yeah. has them. Have you tried yeah. it? Mm -hmm. And? It was good, <laughs> but it was tougher than beef. Okay. It didn't have a nice, soft, like, beef tenderness it was mm -hmm. tougher like mm -hmm. it seemed glutinous to me okay so but that so i yeah it was good but 
I wouldn't go out of my way to buy it personally. But if you were a vegetarian or a vegan and right. needed an alternative, then it's a reasonable alternative. And, and I mean, if in China they're having a, a big pork shortage. This is it. And uh, they use full flavored dishes, right? So mm -hmm. I think that really just mimicking, mimicking the texture is probably all sure. you really need to do. because It's not always needed. Like, I mean, if you have some soup and you want to just have like a couple of meaty chunks in it, like. <laughs> throw in some pork alternative, whatever. Exactly. What works. I want to know, though, is how did it end up at CES? Because of the technology Right, involved. but what technology? I know. I want to know like, more about it. That, I want to know like more about it. Like, you guys are sitting there going, meat, no meat. I'm thinking, meat, good, bacon, good, pig, yeah. good. How you do that. But how they do it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, what is it about the tech that makes this happen? Because, like, Jeff, they clearly, about the it's science. It's but science. the fact science. that there's a tech that pulls a specific thing out of plants that to is then produce it, like, it's like the same thing that comes out of meat. It, like that in and, and it's like they're crazy. creating synthetic meat from plants what happens to the but, it, of the but it's di that's what i mean by it's different from ground up vegetables right. held together with gluten mm -hmm. it's not like texturized vegetable no. protein it's like it's like meat it's like in meat. a lot of ways this is like it's very where, very similar that's yeah. where i that's where it they're getting to, to that the, point yeah. i still yeah. want real bacon it's like the petri dish this is not but like when we've mm -hmm. talked about the petri dish meat that is grown in a dish yes that has never actually been an animal that just right. sounds gross it, yeah it totally does <laughs> But, From a sustainability standpoint, though, I do understand that there's too much factory farming going on. I understand that. Yeah. And, you know, for health's sake, I'm going to, like, eat healthier. Right. I'm not, I'm still eating meat, but I'm not eating as much right. of unhealthy stuff. I just don't cook my eggs and my bacon grease anymore. See? <laughs> healthier. Perfect. <laughs> Moving right along. That's Jeff's solution. <laughs> Google announced on Tuesday all of the new capabilities it's adding to its voice assistant, including various additions to the way it handles privacy. One of the assistant's new privacy features will allow users to delete a record of the most recent command by saying, that wasn't for you. Hmm. This means users can delete voice recordings immediately if someone else starts a separate conversation in the background or if the user decides that what was said should not be shared. Users can also ask, are you saving my audio data to learn more about their privacy controls and to go directly to the settings screen to change their preferences, as well as delete voice assistant activity from a Google account by saying things like, quote, delete everything I said to you this week. Hmm. The assistant has had a fair share of privacy concerns with Google confirming in August that third party workers were systematically listening, systematically listening and leaking private Dutch conversations collected by the assistant. It had been revealed that more than 1,000 files had been leaked from these workers, including recordings from instances where users accidentally triggered Google software. After the incident, Google paused all of its language review operations. These new privacy features come not too long after Google decided to revamp its assistant privacy policy last year. The changes from last year included Google making it default for the voice assistant to not retain audio recordings once a request is fulfilled, meaning that users have to opt in to let Google keep any voice recordings made by the device. It also added a feature that allows users to review and delete past historical audio recordings. Besides the security enhancements, other additions to the assistant announced by Google on Tuesday include the ability to schedule certain tasks. For example, users that have a Google Home integrated washer or dryer can schedule a load of laundry with the assistant. This feature is set to be rolled out later this year. Google has added support for various new smart device categories such as AC units, coffee makers, vacuums, and smart bathtubs, among others. I would love for my device to be able to make me a coffee. Oh, yeah. And bring it to me. <laughs> right. I would like to be able to run a bath. I don't know about other. the bath thing, and I don't know about the anything with water. Bath and laundry, I think I'm against. I'm not against that. Um, I, I think it would be cool. I know that my neighbor down the street has one of the new like washer and dryer in one machine. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
right? So if you put a load of wash in, um, but you know that you're going to be home from work at a certain time and yes. you want that stuff to be not wrinkly, just sitting there, then you could like tap mm. on into your home. See, I'm the guy who <laughs> has had pipes break and had right things like that happen. So for me, it's like I monitor things. Like I check on the laundry while it's happening. Right. I right. check on the la- uh, the dishwasher while it's happening. I don't run them when I'm not home. I super trust my mm, yeah. everything. Uh, <laughs> my dad had it happen where the laundry machine started spraying water all over and they didn't know. Yeah. And it just destroyed their basement. Yep. So it's just like, yeah, I'm not for that. But make me a coffee. Yeah, that'd be all right. And bring it to me. W- what I find interesting about this story is that it's Google. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the story. <Sorry. laughs> it's Google, and they're making changes toward users being able to control their privacy once again. Right. But it's interesting that Google kind of missed the boat on this initially. I feel like Google has kind of always been ahead of the game when it comes to that respect for privacy because they've kind of been the front runner. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact that they're trying to play catch up now and the fact that there was audio breaches where conversations mm-hmm. were being shared. I'm, I'm going, wow, Google, come on. Yeah. But I mean, it's good to see that they're making these changes, it, yes. mm-hmm. you know, but Just it's like all of us, like everybody's learning, right? Including Google, obviously. Right. This, this is why I don't let anyone else do anything. And I do. I'm terrible at delegating because I'm, I'm afraid of someone making mistakes. And, and so they've hired a third party company or maybe they had staff that was doing this job and that staff leaked the information. Yep. Yes. That was meant to be internal. Like we need to improve our product. Now I have an Amazon device at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ditto. So these features like that wasn't meant for you and stuff. Mm-hmm. Are there equivalents on the Amazon devices? I'm seeing very similar kinds of enhancements happening okay. on Amazon. And, you know, I've talked about it before, but uh, the Amazon Echo, I have mine set in the app to make a uh, tone anytime it hears yes. its activity yep. word. And so sometimes you'll hear me if uh, if it goes off here, I just say cancel. So in the middle of a, a conversation, somebody says the, the action word by accident, and I hear delete. And I say cancel it, and it just, now it comes naturally. So, right. uh, and I wish sometimes it would work in real life conversations with humans. I convinced our kids <laughs> that ours is now cancel. named Gecko. Yes. You can change your, what? No, no because, oh, because rhymes. we chose Echo yeah. as the, as the name. Oh, but because you've it got sounds... Gecko, I convinced my kids to call it Gecko. Nice. I'm like, guys, I changed the name to Gecko. So they're like, Gecko. That's cool. <laughs> it's it's a good idea. <laughs> it's fun. I like yeah. that. Totally unrelated to the story. But. Yeah. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Brickman. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Thank you.